Grace to you and peace from God our Creator, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Ever since I was a kid, I've always enjoyed watching the credits at the end of a movie or a television show. And when I lived up in the San Fernando Valley and a number of my neighbors and friends were actually involved in the movie industry, I especially made a point at the end of a movie to watch, see if I can see somebody's name. You know, he might be the person who sweeps out the bathrooms in the studio at the end of a recording day, but maybe his name is there in the credits. You should do that. Not so much for what you can see in the credits, but for what comes afterwards. Every now and then there are surprises. I'm told that there is such a surprise at the end of the current Iron Man movie, giving you some kind of a clue as to what movie they're going to be distributing next year. Whether it's another Iron Man saga or perhaps one of the Avengers. But my favorite trailer at the end of the credits is from one of the greatest movies of all time, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. It's just a great movie. And when the credits are all done, Ferris comes out of the bathroom. He's wrapped up in a towel, evidently just finished showering. He's got a towel wrapped like a turban around his head. And he looks out at us sitting in the theater and goes, what are you doing here? It's over. There is no more. Go home. It's over. And then the screen goes blank. I can imagine that it was very similar to that on that day when Jesus returned to heaven. The disciples saw him being lifted from the ground and rising up into the clouds, and they probably stood there watching. This is making for a really boring video, but you get the idea. <laughs> and you've all done it. I know you've all done this. How many of you had a helium balloon who escaped? And you stood there and you watched it. I think I see it. Uh, I think that's it over there. Maybe it is, maybe, but you, but you watch, because you might see it again. And the apostles stood there watching the skies, hoping to catch another glimpse of Jesus. And the angels appeared to them and asked, what are you doing here? The movie's over. Go back to your lives. Because that was the point. The time that Jesus was apportioned to spend on this earth, preaching his message, establishing God's kingdom among men, had now come to the end of a chapter. And he was returning to his Father's side in heaven. Now notice I said it was the end of the chapter, not the end of the story because the story continues from that day on to this one. Because the mission that Jesus commended his disciples to carry out is still ongoing. You will be my disciples in Jerusalem. Anybody here ever preach the gospel in Jerusalem? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Bueller? Bueller, I, I, had, I had to get that in there. <laughs> Nobody? Okay, how about Judea? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, Samaria. Somebody had to have preached in Samaria, right? Samaria? Anyone? Anyone? How about the uttermost ends of the earth? No one? No one? Isn't this neighborhood, part of the uttermost ends of the earth? I know when I was a student in Fort Wayne, Indiana, I believe that was the uttermost end of the earth. <laughs> it may not have been the actual end, but it was in the same zip code. 
what can I say? You grew up in New York City, everything seems like a small town after that. No. This is part of the territory that Jesus was discussing when he said, you will go and you will preach God's message. And here we are with that mission that God has given to us to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That sins can be forgiven. Lives that were broken hearted can be put together again with the blood that was shed on Calvary. We just got done singing that. This is the area where God's love can be shared. Now I know it is commonly believed that when Jesus said all this, he was making reference to the religious leaders that would continue on throughout the age. Pastors. Who would preach God's word faithfully and administer the sacraments and proclaim the kingdom. But let's stop and think about that for just a minute. Patty, I'm going to pick on you and your husband for a minute, if you don't mind. You're guest with us here today, compliments of the honor you pay to your mom. But you don't live nearby, do you? Well, now you do. I'm arbitrarily deciding that you live nearby, okay? And this morning after church, I'm gonna sit down for coffee with you, and I'll say, you know, it was so great that you could be our guest this morning. I'd like to return the favor and set up a time when I can come to your home and be your guest. And we can talk about how what the church has to offer can have meaning for you. Now, let's say I'm at their home Thursday evening. And they say, tell me a little bit about grace. Do you think I'm going to trot out every dopey, stupid thing that I don't like <laughs> and share that with them. Actually, there are no dopey, stupid things that I don't like other than when pastor gets the order of service all messed up. <laughs> but imagine your reaction. If you ask me to tell you about grace, and I go, oh man, the people there, they are so stubborn. <laughs> they just don't want to get involved in anything. They're stingy. They don't contribute. Their singing could raise the dead. <laughs> they hate every song I pick. Okay, how likely are you to come back again? Probably not at all. Okay, second scenario. You have worshipped with us. You live nearby. I've made arrangements for that turnabout is fair play visit to your home. You ask me, tell me about grace. And I tell you, these are some of the most amazing people I have ever met. Some of the most devoted Christians you're ever going to know. In fact, we took a vote one day and we changed your mother's name. <laughs> Patricia is actually her middle name. Her first name is Faithful. <laughs> and we have another person in our congregation. We changed his first name, Daniel, to his middle name. And we put Loyal as his first name. Loyal Dan Alexander. We've got some of the most devoted people in our congregation. People who will go out of their way over and over again. We've got a secretary who is as patient as she is talented. Because she puts up with all the stuff that pastor sends her at the last minute and expects her to print and have ready for Sunday morning. <laughs> and I go on for a while about how generous our congregation is. Look around. Do you see thousands of people sitting here this morning? One of the Old Testament prophets wrote about Bethlehem and said, even though you are the smallest among the tribes, from you will come something great. It is with a great deal of pride that I can share with you that for many, many years, this tiny little congregation have been some of the strongest contributors to the mission of the church beyond these four walls. With the dollars that we forward to the Pacific Ascendant, school ministries are funded, camp ministries take place, music programs are developed, all sorts of ministry is paid for by this congregation. 
who has met its benevolence goal every year for more years than I can count. Amen. Now, here's the catch. You would expect the pastor of the church to say stuff like that, wouldn't you? Duh. I'm the pastor of the church. Of course I'm going to come and tell you what a wonderful congregation we are. Oh, we have the finest Christians in the world. There's only about two or three hypocrites in the whole bunch. <laughs> Actually, we have a wonderful church here. We have cushions for the pews and everybody who says the pews are too hard. We have sections of two-by-four planking that you can sit on if you believe the pews are too soft. We have calculators so you can count the hypocrites. <laughs> hard hats that you can wear. If you're one of those people who has said, the roof would cave in if I ever set foot in church. <laughs> and our church is perpetually decorated with Christmas poinsettias and Easter lilies for those people who have never seen the church at any other time. <laughs> now, you expect me to say good stuff about us. But now, the third scenario. We have visited with you. I might come and have my time of coffee with you. But then Bob and Karen come to visit. We congratulated Karen this morning. She and her husband have been members of this church for three years today. Amen. They come by and they visit and tell you what this church has meant for them. There was a fella in the kitchen a few minutes ago. I won't mention Billy's name because I don't want to embarrass him. <laughs> but he was mentioning to somebody else, I don't know how a pastor does it. Seems like every time I come to church, he preaches a sermon that's meant just for me. Okay, actually, I don't. Most of the time, it's because I'm preaching to myself and I let you listen in. But it's the spirit that Jesus was talking about in our lessons today that tells me what to say. Because it's the spirit of God that knows what you need to hear. We have a church, and Karen can tell you this, we have a church where pastor preaches sermons that inform us and inspire us on Sunday and mean something to us on Thursday as we apply it in our lives. How cool is that when a member of the congregation comes to visit with them and says, man, I, I really encourage you to come back and visit with us again because here are all the ways this church has meant something to me. It's called a personal testimonial. It's kind of like those fake TV commercials you see where people are raving about some particular product because they were paid to do so. <laughs> We've never offered anybody a dime to go out and share their faith. We're not going to pay you to be a witness. That's up to you. And in our lessons this morning, we have the message that Jesus left this earth because he had to. If he had stayed on earth, then the church, as an institution, would have been focused on him in that one place where he was. He had to go back to heaven because in doing so, he then entrusted the message of hope and love and peace to his followers. And they were the ones who get to go out and share that message. And I did a little research on this. And I discovered that there were all sorts of people who were followers of Jesus who went all sorts of different places to what is now Turkey, Greece, Rome, proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ. Jesus never went to Rome, but his message did. Jesus never went to Ephesus, but Paul went there and established a congregation. Jesus never went to Greece, but several of his followers did. Jesus never came to the United States, but his followers did. Jesus never lived in our neighborhood, but we do. And we proclaim that message, that Jesus has set up his tent in our hearts and has given us his spirit to inspire us, to empower us, and to lead us. Next week, we're going to continue this story. 
when we talk about the Pentecost and how Jesus sent his spirit into the hearts of people in a way even more profound than he had already done. So we invite you to come on back for part two of this morning's message. But now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.